Chapter five. At last, Nell was on her way to Crown Couture, the fashion house where Pear worked. It was the kind of day that can lift your heart no matter what your troubles. Bright and blustery with clouds scudding across the piercing blue sky and leaves blowing skittishly along the pavements. Nell skirted her way around the Place de la Concorde and into the Jardin des Tuileries. She could see straight away how different these gardens were to the familiar London parks. Less wild and altogether more ordered, with avenues of trees marching up and down and ornamental ponds dotted about at equal intervals. Pear was going to get such a surprise when she saw her, Nell thought, as she left the park and cut across the Rue de Rivoli. She patted her bulging satchel by her side. She'd packed her maps and a few items of clothing, and she had her money ready to change at the bank. If Pear wasn't at Crown Couture, she would meet her at her flat in Belleville. Good riddance to Melinda and Gerald. The thought was even more delicious than the buns she'd just eaten. She wiped her mouth on the end of her sleeve, imagining her mother's shudder of disgust. She would never have to listen to her saying, Manners, Penelope, ever again. Turning the corner, Nell felt a shiver of excitement. This was the road she was looking for. In her letters, Pear had written about the Rue du Faubourg Saint-Honoré. It was the street of the Grand Ateliers, where, behind the elegant facades, in a whirl of tape measures, fabric and thread, exquisite cloth was snipped, sewn and, at the hands of the sempstresses, turned into the most beautiful gowns. Nell could see straight away that the road was every bit as luxurious as Pear had described. Here was the shop selling the finest teas, there was the elegant emporium displaying the rarest perfumes and, mmm, Nell couldn't help but pause to admire the confectioner's window showcasing the airiest macarons piled one on top of the other in clouds of powder pink, pistachio and the palest blue. She was here at last and Crown Couture was just as impressive as all the other establishments on the street, fronted by a huge plate glass window upon which the trademark crown was emblazoned in curly gold script. Nell pushed through the door and stepped inside. The first thing she noticed was the smell, which was light and sweet like face powder mixed with the scent of fresh roses after rain. The second was the music, a waterfall of notes dipping and rising, a joyous sound that made you think of rivers and lakes and glorious spring days. The third was altogether more human, clacking angrily across the floor towards her on spiked heels. Before Nell even had the chance to open her mouth, let alone explain, the lady had swiftly placed a manicured hand on her chest and was propelling her firmly backwards towards the door and the street. Stop, said Nell, pushing back. The room was entirely white. Melinda would have loved it. White sofas, white flowers, even the clothes on the mannequins were white. This is not a place for little girls, the lady hissed, her eyes narrowing to slits, especially not little girls dressed like street urchins. Her gaze took in Nell's jeans and sweatshirt and she wrinkled her nose in distaste. Monsieur Crown will not allow it. You'll give him a heart attack. She was looking at Nell as if she had just climbed out of a ditch. They're clean, protested Nell, thinking this woman was almost as rude as her mother. If you don't mind, I would like to see Pear. I mean, Perrine Chaumet. She works here. The woman's beehive quivered. I have no idea what or who you are talking about. I think you had better leave immediately. And it is not only the cleanliness of your clothes I am objecting to, it is the look of them. There is no cut to them at all. You are quite spoiling the ambiance. Perrine Chaumet, Nell burst out. She is a sempstress, but she embroiders too. Please show me where she is. Monsieur Crown doesn't have to see me, and if he doesn't see me, he can't be offended. You'll do more than offend him, little girl. It's out of the question. The woman's mouth was set in a determined line, and she motioned impatiently at Nell to leave. Nell wasn't going to give up that easily, and she was about to say so when a hole suddenly appeared in the wall, and another woman dressed in a white lab coat stepped out. Madame Valérie, the woman said brusquely, looking over her glasses with a superior air. What is going on? We can hear this racket all the way up on the second floor. Is the client here yet? I have six appointments this morning and you know very well five of them can be difficult. Nell peered behind the woman. What she had thought was a hole in the wall was actually a concealed door and behind the door was a flight of stairs. Madame Josette, started Madame Valérie. But Nell did not wait to hear Madame Valérie's explanation. Pear must be upstairs, despite what Madame Valérie said, and she was going to find her. Elbowing her way past Madame Josette, she darted through the door and up the winding staircase, ignoring the angry hisses shooting after her. Good. 
At least they weren't shouting. They must be too frightened to raise their voices in case they alerted Monsieur Crown. Would he really have a heart attack if he saw her? She pictured him setting eyes on her and keeling over, and all because she was wearing jeans. She knew from Pear's letters that Monsieur Crown was an eccentric man, passionate to the point of madness about the creations he designed. But surely he would understand. Carrying on up the steps, she reached the first floor and skittered fast past two doors, one emblazoned with Monsieur Crown Couturier, the other Madame Josette Premier. Along from these was another winding staircase, smaller and rickettier than the first. Up this she went to the second floor, two more doors. The one on the right read tailleur and the one on the left read flu. Quickly she pushed open the one nearest her, tailleur. It was a small neat room furnished with about a dozen small sewing tables and the same number of dressmakers dummies. There were at least 12 women in the room, some sitting at sewing tables, heads bent intent on the work in front of them. Others stood, pins in mouths, tape measures flying, pinning and shaping wools and silks into forms that would soon become dresses and jackets and coats. No one looked up as Nell entered. No one issued a greeting. The only sounds were the snip of scissors, the rustle of fabric, a needle being gently laid down. Nell searched the rows of bent heads, looking for Pear's curls, coiled like ropes, glinting and golden. Nell remembered how Pear pushed her hair back, tucking the coils behind her ears. Sometimes she wore a ribbon, moss green velvet or turquoise satin to hold it in place. But Nell couldn't see any golden curls or colourful ribbons. The women were dressed in identical white coats and their hair was uniformly unadorned, scraped back tight as tight into neat buns and braids. Excuse me, Nell approached the young woman sitting nearest to her. She was holding a length of midnight blue fabric in her hands, turning and whipping it with deft invisible stitches. But she must not have heard because her head remained bent and she continued to sew. Nell tried again a little bit louder and clearer this time. Excuse me, madam, I am looking for a seamstress called Perrine Chaumet. At last, the woman stopped and carefully laid her stitching down. Her eyes met Nell's briefly before glancing away. I'm sorry, she spoke quietly, using the kind of voice teachers at school sometimes called library tones, but there is no one of that name here. But she works here, insisted Nell. Hush! A woman working on the next row looked up. Please be quiet, she said. Talking is bad for the concentration. You heard, Claudia, now I think you had better leave. Nell stared at the bent heads. She felt hot and confused. A rush of panic washed over her. Pear had to be here, she had to be. Backing out of the room, she crossed the corridor and opened the other door, the one marked flu. This room looked just the same as the other. Twelve sewing tables, twelve bent heads. But instead of working with plain silks and wools, the fabrics here were sparkling and fluttering with lace and frills and flounces. Again, no one looked up. Again, no one spoke. Excuse me, Nell began. Everyone ignored her. Needles flew, scissors snipped, eyes remained cast down. I'm looking for a sempstress named Perrine Chaumet, Nell said, her voice rising. Where is she? Not here, an older woman looked up from her work, frowning. How did you get past Madame Josette? I think you'd better... Go, said Nell, feeling the anger rise. Why wouldn't anyone take proper notice of her? Why wouldn't they help? No, I won't go. Not until someone explains. I know she works here. Madame? A young girl was speaking. Very young, Nell thought. Perhaps only one or two years older than herself. She laid down the stuff she was working on and seemed to be appealing to the older woman. A straggle of red hair had escaped from the two plaits pinned on top of her head. Be quiet, mademoiselle, and carry on with your sewing. The older woman spoke sharply. Your concentration is lapsing again, and you know I promise to inform Monsieur Crown if you aren't up to the work. Think about your mother now, do. But... The girl turned, and now saw a flicker of uncertainty in her greeny-grey eyes, and understood instantly that the girl knew something, and was deliberating whether she should just come out with it and defy the older woman. But as the girl opened her mouth and Nell moved towards her, the door to the studio flew open and a small whirlwind burst in. Mon Dieu! A rotund man dressed in a three-piece pinstriped suit glared angrily at them. I might have known it would be you! The man shot an eagle-eyed stare in the direction of the red-haired girl. No concentration, no control. How do you expect me to create with this cacophony going on? 
I have five ball gowns to sketch, each to be a triumph of form and beauty, and you know very well I cannot do it unless I have utter silence. Nell winced. So this must be the famous Monsieur Crown. She hadn't wanted to get anyone into trouble. If they would only talk to her, tell her what was going on, then she would leave them alone. The man threw his arms up in the air and brought them down to his head, as though in great pain. I'm sorry, Monsieur Crown, shouted the girl, started the girl. Stop, shouted the little man, holding out his hand. No more words. Get back to work this instant and we will review your behaviour later. Still quivering, the man turned and came face to face with Nell. He stumbled backwards as though he had been shot. What in the name of God are you? he gasped. My name is Nell started Nell. I didn't ask who, I asked what, the man cried shrilly, issuing a fusillade of words that Nell had never heard before. Madame, he appealed to the older woman who had admonished the young girl earlier. What is it, this thing dressed in denim and a... He looked at Nell again, shielding his eyes. A sweatshirt, blemishing my workroom, sullying my studio. Who let her in? Oh, it's hurting my eyes. Get her out, get her out. I can only have beauty and purity or all is lost. But I'm looking for Perrine. I know she works here, said Nell in a rush. He had worked himself up into a frenzy. He wasn't listening to her properly. Why won't anyone tell me what's going on? Josette Valérie, the man shouted, shrill and urgent, taking up a bell like the one they used at school to call them in after break, jangling and jangling it, hurting Nell's ears. Get her out! Get her out! And then Nell's arms were being held and she was being marched, no, dragged, out of the room, along the corridor, down the narrow winding staircase, along to the front door and pushed out into the street. How dare you, said Valérie. This person you are looking for does not work here said josette now go away said valerie and don't come back